Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. I'm so excited you're here. I love seeing faces instead of blank pews. So praise God, whether you have a mask or not. So glad you're here. So glad to see you. Uh, online, welcome. We're so glad you're joining us. Uh, if you're new, I want to say welcome. We're so glad you came. We want to get to know you. Uh, we'd love to figure out how we can plug you in and help you integrate into our church family. And so if you would just text the word welcome to the phone number 661-218-1090, uh, that helps us get in contact with you and connect you. And we would love to do that. Also want to say thank you to all the generosity in our church as God keeps providing for us. Uh, and let you know that there are four ways to give. You see up there, the newest one is to text. So if you text the word Laurel Glen to the number 77977, um, you can start doing that as well. So we want to say thank you. Uh, if you're unable to give, that's okay. And if you're in need, let us know. We want to help you, love you, walk with you, be with you through this process. So please, please let us know. Um, also want to say we're excited to start VBS tomorrow. Uh, the staff and the volunteers have gone through a lot of trouble to record this and help you do this at home with the launch tomorrow. We're excited to continue to help kids learn about Jesus uh, through God's Word. And lastly, happy Father's Day. So excited for the dads. Um, just our prayer for you. Yeah, dads, it's tough being a dad. And uh, just excited and pray that you would continue to lead your family according to God's Word. And so I'm going to pray, and then we'll start. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. Uh, just how good it is to gather and to open your word. Uh, we pray your, our hearts would be transformed by your words, uh, that your word would guide us and direct us, that we would cling closely to what the Bible says. It would encourage us, equip us, uh, and help us know that we are not alone, you are with us, and you have direction for us. And we should be uh, just calm and excited knowing you're there. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are starting a new sermon series I'm very excited about. Uh, we're calling it Gospel 2020. And our goal is to kind of take a look at what's happening in the world and process it through what does the Bible say. And so the Bible is our guide and the gospel is our solution. And we're going to do that over the next probably six weeks, but I've committed to going as long as necessary. Um, and so I might not get to everything you're hoping for today, but I promise, I promise, I promise we will get to it at some point. Even if I have to do a nerd alert or a podcast, we will go to the deeper things that maybe you aren't. So our goal in this is what does the Bible say about what's going on? And so when you approach it as that, that's what's called a biblical worldview. Now, I want you to notice we did not say a U.S. view, okay? It is a worldview. So a worldview is how do you process and make sense of life? How do you structure things to determine what you're seeing in the world? How do you make sense of the world? Every worldview has what we call presuppositions, which is a, another way of saying assumptions. As Christians, we assume God created us, right? The Bible is God's authority. It's his communication to us. Jesus is the only way to God, and we're to treat people a certain way because of the way God has told us to live. And so when we see things, we say, that's not right, because our view is that God is the creator and the giver. And so that's kind of what we want to do is process here this morning. Okay, do I have a biblical worldview? Are my actions and decisions tied to what I'm seeing in the Bible? So uh, when we look at Romans 1, 18 through 25, uh, we see that God is laying out how to think and how to process. And he says from, and we're going to jump here in the middle and then go back to the beginning. But in verse 20, it says, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. So God said, I have set this up and made this clear since the very beginning. Okay, so let us go to the very beginning. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to look at how did God create this? How did God set it up? And what can we know based on what we see? And so what we see is God has created 
the earth. He's created Adam and Eve. He's told them to be fruitful and multiply. He has told them to tend to the garden, the animals, and creation, and they're to rule over it. But he's also said, hey, don't touch this tree. This one tree, no, you don't get to touch it. You will die. Everything else is good. So we pick up a conversation where Satan is talking to Eve. So Genesis chapter 3 starts in verse 1. He said to the woman, this is Satan, did God actually say? You can explain everything that's going on in this world because of that sentence. Did God actually say? This is how he starts. You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. So she thinks about it and she has an answer. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. So clearly she knows. Yeah, God said, don't touch it. But he did say we can have all of this, but he said, don't touch that. So a rule enters into the, into the equation, and now Satan begins to question the rule. Verse 4, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Like, clearly God's lying. Clearly God was being sarcastic. Clearly God didn't really mean that. Verse 5, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So how does the first sin start? It starts with a story of there's an oppressor and you're being oppressed. Look at it for what it is. God's holding out. You could be like him, but he won't let you. There's this one thing that if you did it, you could be like God. You would have this full knowledge of good and evil. He's withholding from you. So instead of Eve now seeing that God said yes to this and no to that, now she's going, God's holding out. I could be God. I could have this if I just took a bite. You're on to something. So she takes a bite, sin enters the world, and that's where the idea of an, a utopia ends. A utopia is what people are saying, a perfect world where everybody is nice and loving and kind and equal. The second sin entered the world, the utopia died, and it will never come back until heaven. Because as long as there is sin, there will be sinners. As long as there's sinners, they're going to make sinful decisions and impose them on sinful people. This is the, the framework we see in the Bible. Now, God made a rule, right? God made a creation. He made a rule. Now there's a consequence. So let's look at Genesis 3. Look at 16 and 17. God tells the woman, hey, there's going to be pain in childbearing. Thank you, Eve, right? There's going to be enmity. There's going to be strife. You're going to want to rule over your husband. There's going to be conflict. Hey, Adam, you're going to have to work. You're going to sweat. It's going to be painful. So what do we see as part of the consequence coming out of the disobedience? There's going to be conflict. There's going to be pain. And there's going to be suffering. Those three things remain today as a consequence to sin. So from a Christian worldview, we're seeing from the very beginning God sets order. When you disobey it, there's a consequence. Part of those consequences will be suffering, pain, and conflict. And so this is the beginning of a worldview. God sets the standard. There's rules that when you break them, there's consequences. So when we look at this, we have to begin to think, okay, do I trust the very first premise because essentially, what does Eve do? She makes a conscious decision that God's withholding from me. And so there comes a point where we just have to trust that God said no, and I'm going to do what he says. And that's our worldview as we work forward. Because if you've ever taught VBS or kids, what do they always do? Why? 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 And eventually, what do you got to say? Because God said so. Right? And that's just there, and you either trust it or you don't. And so what do we see God saying? I made a rule, you broke it, here are your consequences. Now because of that consequence, now we can pick up Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men 
who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So what is the truth that is being suppressed? Well, if you go back to the garden, it's God's not letting you be in charge. God's not letting you be him. And so essentially you suppress the truth that God says this is good and that's bad. And you say, I know better. I know a better way. I know how to fix this. So this is the beginning of how uh, worldviews come into play. They begin to tell us, uh, how can I come up with a better way because I don't like God's way or I don't think God's um, giving me what I deserve or I don't think God's being fair. Now you look at the text, you work through some of these things. What is it saying that they are doing? It's saying in verse 21, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. Go back to the garden. I know God, but I think he's wrong, right? So keep working your way through the verse. Um, Although they they, did, sorry, or give thanks to God, but they became futile in their thinking and foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man. And so essentially, there's the, the exchange is, God, you're in charge, but now I'm in charge, or I'm going to go a direction that I think is wise, that'll help create maybe the world I want, or the personal life that I want, and it's going to give me the things that I need. So this, at this point, this is what we call a rebellion. You're rebelling against, God said this, I'm going to do that. And what's crazy is rebellions always start off kind of fun, and rebellion is even kind of like uh, really exciting for a little bit, just like to put it real simple. Like we've all rebelled against the, the, the rules for COVID-19, right? At some point, you said, I'm over this mask, I'm over listening to the rules, and you charge in the exit when it's the entrance, right? And you charge out the wrong way, and you're not going to stand on that spot, and you're not going to wait, and you're not going to let that guy go. And you're not going to wear the mask. You are, you know, whatever it is. You're not going to sanitize. You're going to sneeze on your hand instead of your elbow. You're going to cough inappropriately. Whatever it is, you're like, yes, you are not telling me what to do. And there's this kind of like excitement about it. And I imagine even Eve was like, I'm going to be like God, right? And rebelling is fun until there's consequences. It's the same like when you're trying to get somewhere fast and you're speeding, you're like, oh, I'm going to get there so much faster. This is so good. Until you get a ticket, until you have to pay the ticket, and you have to pay the insurance and da, 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 da. Consequences all of a sudden bring down what you thought was going to be fun. So here's what I want to get at. When you come to a worldview, the exchange you're trying to make here in, in Romans is that God doesn't know what's best than I do. So what a worldview says is, I know how to make life right, or at least my life right. So when you look at Marxism, socialism, secularism, deism, pluralism, um, there's some other isms out there. I'm not going to go through all of them, but what you need to essentially understand is they're all trying to do the same thing. We know a better way. We know how people should live, how they should be valued, and how... Um, the world should work. And we're going to place our view here and put God down here. God's way doesn't work because we're determining ethics, morals, uh, people's worth, how people should be structured and ordered. So essentially what happens is you have a group of people. They decide this is the way to live. They're the governing people. And then you have the people they're governing over. And essentially what happens is you're the oppressor and we're the oppressed. And it's like, I don't like your rules, so I'm going to get a group, build it, build it, and now I'm going to fight you, and if I can't beat you, I'm going to get more people, more people, I'm going to get a bigger hammer, and boom, now we make the rules. Well, we don't like those rules. It's an endless cycle of oppressor and oppressed, okay? Now, here's the problem with these worldviews. These worldviews want to make statements like, um, these lives matter, and those lives matter, and this matters, and we should do this, and we shouldn't do that. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but hear me very carefully. They're all starting in the middle. Do you not think this is an important question? If you're saying, I should not be able to punch you in the face, why? How would you back that up? 
well, it's wrong. Well, where does it say it's wrong? Well, it's, a, it's like a government law or something. Government laws change all the time. All I got to do is get a big group of people, get a piece of paper, get another group of people, get a decision. Not a law. So it's relative. Laws change all the time. That's your interpretation of the law. Again, why should I not punch you? Why should I not throw rocks at your kids? Why should I not shove you every time I see you? Why? Says who? Make them start at the beginning. They don't have an answer. Because what the society tries to do is says, this is how people should be treated. We say so. Until they say, no, oh no, you don't. We don't want to be treated like that. We think we should own our property. We think the government should own our property. We think this. So it's an endless cycle of the oppressors or oppressed trying to conquer the oppressors, right? It never works. And, and this is why God says, okay, you guys think you got a better system? Verse 24, therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts and the impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. And this is where it begins to fall apart. God says, you want a world without me? Here you go. Because essentially what God is saying, I am God, I know what's best, follow me. And we're saying, no, 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 I know what's best. Because in a worldview, you're trying to answer questions like, am I loved? Why do I hurt? Does my life have meaning? Why can't we all just get along? Is there any hope for this world? You're trying to answer these questions. And you're trying to make decisions to fix those holes inside of you that are yearning for these answers. So some people make, you know, a worldview where it's, it's just for me to be happy, right? Just live to make you happy. But what happens when my happiness collides with your happiness? And we want opposing things. Who's right and who's wrong? This is why I said, says who? Well, if you ask a scientific naturalist, right, survival of the fittest, whoever's got the bigger hammer, whoever can run faster, punch harder, or swim further, wins. So now you got a, a, a never-ending cycle of competition to be on top so that you can get what you want. God's saying, this doesn't work. But, you know, go for it. Go for it. And, th and this, is, I mean, this is not a new problem. You go back, this is Eve going to God. No, I want to eat that tree. I think it's right. Look at Israel. We don't want you to be king. We want a human king. We want a theocracy. We want a God ruled through a king. And then it's like, you know what, God, you get out of the way. We want a monarchy. Israel doesn't like it. They're still in a bad position. Then, you know what I mean? People have been telling God, no, 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 we want this. No, 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 we want this. No, 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 we want this. He goes, okay, fine. We have to be the ones that say, you know what? You don't want a godless world. That is not what you want. God's word warned us this would happen. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 5 reads like this. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Okay, so, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. So, sound teaching, right, suppressing the truth. Jesus says he's the truth. Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Jesus uses God's word, right? So, sound teaching is saying this is what God says. There's going to come a time when people go, you know what, that's not fixing the problem I see. The Bible is insufficient. Right? And so there's this itching. There's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way. And I'm going to give you an example of abortion because I think right now we're, we're kind of too charged to look at the, you know, kind of race part of this. But I think if you take principles, they apply no matter what because truth is truth. So when you have a, an abortion clinic and that abortion clinic is still open, and you have someone talking to a Christian, and they're like, you know what? God wouldn't want this. This is death. This is murder. This is wrong. We should go burn that place down. That'll stop it. That'll change it. Well, silent teaching says, love your brother, love your neighbor as yourself, right? And so when they say, well, 
based on what should you love them? Based on God's word. That's my world view. Well, I don't like that. It's not changing anything. I don't think God wants that. Let's go burn it down. So they go burn it down. Now they're accumulating for themselves teachers that suit, the, suit their passions. Like, don't listen to that guy. He teaches from the Bible. Listen to this guy. Burn, loot, torch. Let's go. Let's make a difference. Let's make a change. Let's find people who agree with us and make it a worldview that we enact and inflict justice. Verse 4, and they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, be sober-minded, endure suffering. Notice it says endure suffering, not you will not suffer. The Bible is very clear. There is no utopia until heaven. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be pain. There's going to be conflict. And as a Christian, you're to navigate that through a biblical worldview. Now you start looking back at our text that doesn't suppress the truth, that sees verse 20, God's eternal power, his divine nature. So eternal power, he knows everything and he can do everything. So if he's allowing it, maybe we should take a second before we start saying, God, I want to exchange you. Are we all powerful? No. So maybe he should stay up there. He has a divine nature, meaning he's completely other. He's always good, always kind, always just. Wrath, mercy, love, good. He's all of those things all of the time. He is divine. He's uncreated. Okay, maybe I should keep him there. Keep working your way through the text. Verse 21, instead of not giving, we should honor him. God said, don't do it. I'm not going to do it. Why? Because God said so. I'm honoring him. Keep working your way through the passage, give thanks to him. God, thank you that I know what to do, that you love me, that you protect me, that you tell me what to do. And then you come all the way down here to verse 25. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So when you think of this, it's saying, no, worship God, not the creature. So if you look at this, you know, we don't have wooden idols and we don't have statues necessarily that we worship. We have systems and structures. And we say, if you did this system, everything would change. Everyone would be happy. Everyone would be valued. And we worship the structure, a la idol, and not God. To what God says, no, 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 you serve me, you honor me, you praise me. You see my divine nature. You see my eternal power and you trust me. You don't exchange me. You say, God, I don't understand what's going on, but I know according to your word, I should do fill in the blank. So this leads us to how do you approach this? My first encouragement to you is when we look at Jesus, did Jesus overthrow Rome? Did Jesus come in, get rid of the emperor, destroy the army, put the Jews in charge, and say, ah, you're no longer, no, he didn't. And guess who got mad at him because he didn't? His disciples. Why are we not, right? Don't go to the cross, are you kidding me? Get behind me, Satan. Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is getting crucified. Peter pulls out the sword, like, let's rock, let's roll, let's take back what's ours, our lands. And Jesus is like, no, I'm going to the cross. And the disciples are bewildered, confused. Why? Because they're being oppressed. The Romans are telling them, we're smarter than you. We're better than you. You guys aren't even human. Like, you're lucky we even let you breathe. And the Jews are sitting there going, what? This is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. And Jesus goes, yeah, that's why I'm going to the cross. They're like, what? The cross? He's like, yeah, there I'm going to put an end to suffering, sin, systems, and structures ran by sinners, enforced by sinners, and upheld by sinners. See, because when you go back to the abortion clinic, you think of it this way. There's an unborn baby getting killed, right? God loves that baby. There's a mom in there. God loves that mom. There's a doctor performing it. God loves that doctor. There's an owner of that establishment. God loves that owner. And God desires that all of them would come to repentance to know his son Jesus as their savior and that be the solution 
to what they're yearning for. He doesn't say, create a system, take down the structure, and create a new structure. He says, preach Christ crucified. This is why the apostles go to city to city to city, not to overthrow kings and governments, but to preach Christ crucified. There's a bigger picture playing out. People need to go to heaven. People need to know Jesus. Hearts need to change. There will always be systematic, sinful structures. Doesn't matter which one you pick. There's going to be people that don't like it and people that are oppressed. Until heaven, that's the way it's going to be. So then what do we do? We go to Romans chapter 12. Okay? Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to the world. So the Bible is very clear. God's word is going to be taught to you. You're going to understand it, right? Go back to Romans 2. It's clearly perceived. It's clearly known. You see he's to be worshipped and honored and served. But then you're going to go to the world, and they're going to want to say, oh, you're a Christian. You don't love people. Your God's mean. He's not loving. Look at all the injustice. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. And you're going to be like, yeah, let's go. Let's go do that. Let's go change that. And all of a sudden, you're not taking your orders from God. You're taking your orders from a worldview that denies God. And in this worldview, they're God because they're the lawmaker and the lawgiver and the law maintainer. They're the decider. And you're being driven by them because you want to make a change that you're frustrated God won't. He's saying that pressure is going to come on you. Come on, Christian, listen to me. Come on, Christian, listen to me. You're bad. You're bad. You're bad. God's withholding. Your view's not working. Your structure falls. This falls. Look at what we could get done right now. They're saying you're going to want to conform. You're going to have itching ears. So what's the Bible solution? But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That is by testing you may discern what is the will of God. What is good and acceptable and perfect. He's saying, okay, you gotta, you got to come back and you got to transform and renew your mind because you're going to get pounded and pounded and pounded. you got to come back to God's word. Make sure it's true. Make sure it's good, acceptable, perfect, and according to God's will. These are very good measures for us to look at. So one of the easiest things, I think, for us to look at, you look at a couple Psalms, they're very clear. Psalm 119.11 I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So when the world's trying to conform you and you're like, hey, let's go. This is bad. This is bad. And you're taking that step. God's word goes, hey, remember who knows everything? You might not know the answer, but you know that's not the answer. And you know he is the answer. Let's take a step back. The word hidden in the heart helps prevent you. Verse 48 of 119, I will lift up my hands towards your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. The saying is, as I meditate, I realize, wow, God's actually reasonable and loving and kind and gracious. God, I'll go wherever you want. I'll do whatever you want. I trust you. You're the decision maker in my worldview. You're the creator, the moral law giver. I'm the abider and the created. I trust you. Okay? So that's the beginning. Next, I want you to Realize this, Matthew 16, 24 through 28. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let them deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. So, so, so now the practicality of this worldview is, is you trust him and you deny yourself and follow him. You waive your right to be right. You look at all the other worldviews, it's like, you are the smartest person. You should do you, you should... Do what you want, what you want. You're the only person who can decide that. No one knows you better than you. You decide for you. It's all about filling yourself. Again, in the worldview, how do they handle conflict? I think this is right, and I'm told I'm right if I feel right. Well, I feel right, and I disagree with you. How do we handle it? Create a group, get power. Create a group, get power. Crash, 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 see who's standing. Instead of, I don't deserve to make these decisions. I'm not perfect. I'm not all-knowing. I'm not God. Therefore, I will deny myself, and I'll follow Jesus, because he lived the perfect life, died the perfect death, overcame sin, overcame death, rose from the grave. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to trust him more than I trust myself. 
more than I trust anything. I'm going to trust him. Verse 25, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses life for my sake will find it. Verse 26, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world forfeits his soul? So he's saying, what profits a man if you say this is the way it needs to be, this is the way it needs to be? Or even take it in a different context. I need this job, I need this job, I need this car, I need this car, and I will do whatever it takes to get it. So you'll lie, you'll cheat, you'll steal, you'll ignore your family, you'll do whatever it takes, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, and then you finally get the job, maybe the world, maybe the car, you finally get it. But you forfeited your morality, your character, and your soul. So you have your social structure. You're going to hell. What good did it do you? You have the bank account you want, but it cost you hell. What good did it do you? You can fight for this all you want, but even if you get it, what it's going to cost you to get it, looting, rioting, right? Bad morality. You're going to lose your soul in the process. What good did you do that you changed the world? But when you die, you're gone. He's saying it profits you nothing. This is why deny yourself, follow Jesus. This is why we have to tell the world, no, no, like you need Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Building a structure, it's just going to be built by sinful people and forced by sinful people, want to be broken up by sinful people. Jesus is the solution. And we'll get to that later. But for my conclusion, how do we approach this? I think we got to hit the reset button. Because I think the problem is, you know, a lot of the times we hear what's going on on Sunday, and it's like, amen, praise God, yes, yes, say it again, preacher. And then we walk out the door, and you get to work, and you're like, I'm going to put this over here, and we're going to come back over here. What'd you call me? Oh, I deserve me, 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 me. They're terrible, they're terrible, and they're terrible, and I'm the only one who's a good employee in this whole, right? God's word doesn't govern that part. When you think of your ethics and your morals, your language, what you call right and wrong, can you find it in here? When you look at your parenting, do you parent according to God's word? Do you Deuteronomy 6, teach them what is good and bad according to God's word? Can you look at your life and say, in a biblical worldview is what we're trying to do, everything I do, I can find in here, and I know when I'm not doing it, it's sin. I'm not secretly calling it good. I know it's sin, I know it's wrong, and I'm working on it. In your marriage, it's like, oh, you're not going to do that? I'm going to go find someone else. You don't make me happy. I don't get butterflies anymore. I, I fell out of love with you. I deserve to be happy. Oh, really? That's here? Well, no, no, it does. does. Yeah, we're not, we're not there right now. We're over here. See what I'm saying? In your work, in your parenting, in your marriage how you view other people. When you're saying, I'm going to love that person, you're not doing it because it's politically correct. You're doing it because it's biblically correct. I am a Christian. God said, love your neighbor as yourself. God said, regardless of any color, I am to love them. Regardless of political position, I am to love them. And regardless of what I see wrong, it's not my job to fix them. It's my job to tell them God is the author. God is the creator. The Bible is the guide. Jesus is the savior. The Holy Spirit is the helper. That's my job. I can show you here where I'm supposed to do that. So we begin to evaluate our lives. Even your finances. My money, God's money. Like, evaluate your life and say, start, start. Make categories. Can I show where that is in the Bible? And again, if I tell you something and it's not in the Bible, challenge it. In a time of chaos, where everyone has competing ideas, who should win? God should win. Well, how do we know? Right here. It'll tell us. So here's, here's my overall conclusion. You know, the world's freaking out because they're trying to solve this, solve this, solve this, solve that. As a Christians, we shouldn't freak out. Why? Because God's there. He's told us what to do. He's given us the Holy Spirit to help us. He saved us through his son, Jesus. We will go to a utopia. We'll go to heaven. There won't be any of this. It'll come. It'll be there. What we need to focus on 
is how do I apply what's in here? How does it move from here to here? So that I represent what's in here through my actions. And we'll get to that as the series progresses. But right now, I just want us to be thankful that we have a God that loves us, that shows us, that tells us, that saves us, and through the Holy Spirit helps us. That's a breath of fresh air for me. We have a starting point. We have a, we have a way forward because God cared enough to write it down for us and help us figure it out together. Amen? Let's worship. God, we love you. You're amazing. And I pray as the passage reads that we would not suppress the truth, but we would honor you in service, in worship. We would be so grateful that we have you. We have your word. We have your Holy Spirit. We are not alone. And God, as we meditate on your word and as we press into seeing the world through your lens, through the Bible, that we would not be conformed to the world, but we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds through your word, searching what is good and what is according to your will. You are so good to us. May we respond in worship that we're thankful and grateful. You wrote it down, and you're going to help us carry it out. We're so thankful. In Jesus' great name we pray. Amen.